Hello and welcome to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast, a podcast where we discuss all things relating to your well-being, including interviews with experts in the fields of nutrition, physical and mental health, and my five-minute food fact series. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host, a nutritionist with a passion for well-being. Before I introduce today's guests, I will take a moment to let you know that you can subscribe to my podcast on YouTube, hit the red subscribe button, or on your favourite podcast app, iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. I will also mention that although I will often be speaking with experts, any information or advice provided in Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast is not intended to be used to treat, cure, or prevent injuries, disease, or medical conditions. And it is not a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Today I am here with Melissa Stefano, the founder of Cancer Confidence. Melissa's career has encompassed education, consulting roles, choreography, and more. Then she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And today we'll chat about how that influenced her life in a creative and passionate way. Hi Mel, welcome to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm really grateful. My pleasure. So Mel, you've had an interesting and varied career, including 25 years in education and consultative roles. You're a highly awarded choreographer and a coach. And in 2015, you were diagnosed with breast cancer and that changed your world in so many ways. So before we talk about cancer, I'd like our listeners to get to know you a little bit better. So can you tell us something about yourself? For example, where did you grow up? Would you believe Adelaide? Adelaide, After what a great place. <laughs> After 25 years in Sydney, I'm back here. So I'm very grateful to be back here. When uh, I left for Sydney. How it, old were you then? 23. 23. Mm-hmm. I was starry eyed. I'm going to be a star. <laughs> and the glitter sort of all falls down around me. I made the decision to go there, noticing that the opportunities here for performing arts were sort of there, but not, not as, yeah. not as big. To be fair, when I got there, I realized, and of course, in hindsight, that my move to Sydney wasn't so much about performing arts, but more about coming out. So I moved to Sydney to come out, to be part of a community that was not only creative, but the gay mm. community in Adelaide. It probably wasn't as welcome yeah, I'm sure you're right. I think it's probably an easier place. And also, I guess if you're away from your parents too, it takes away some of those family issues around that kind of thing, I imagine. Exactly. Yeah. And I want to be clear, my parents are totally behind me. They 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 waved the flag for me. Oh, uh, good. At the time, there was no wag, there was no flag waving, so to speak. <laughs> uh, being Italian as well, that's my heritage. Yeah. And I'm very proudly an Italian. So this Italian gay sort of queer, you know, outspoken, creative person. My parents are going like, what? What is this? This doesn't even exist in this world. I think Adelaide's too small for you, baby. <laughs> and bless my mom. Uh, she's always wanted me to, to be in a, a bright and vibrant place. And ex- which is why I'm moving to Italy in six months. So- yeah, that's exciting, isn't it? Is there a gay community over there that you're aware of? or Look, I think in all of the major cities there are gay communities. Mm. And to be fair, we're dealing with a really different life today. We see a lot of things about, you know, non-acceptance. And yes, there is non-acceptance, but there's also a lot of people who totally welcome yep. and embrace, embrace all types of love. So you'll find in the centres of most cities, in yeah. Milano, in Rome, there's going to be a community. Um, and that's where I'll be staying anyway, because there'll be the creative, my work in the cancer industry, my work in the creative industries at the center of those cities. And also you obviously surround yourself with the right people. Exactly. Also, I'd like to know, so what do you love to do? Probably I, lots of things. I love this question. My favorite things to do when I'm not working because I do love my work and work doesn't feel like work for me. Mm. I want to be really clear. Uh, I yoga a lot. So I'm a ah. yoga teacher. I studied in 2008, best thing I ever did. Wow. Uh, Yeah, so that was why yoga a lot. I do a lot of um, meditation. That's something that I adopted when I turned, or it would have been easy, 39 about now, and I just Mm -hmm. went, there has to be a different way. Yeah, I agree. When the dance, the dance to me is a meditation, and that had to sort of move and change based on how my body changed and I got tired and sore and Mm. I just went crack, crack. 
So meditation is big for me. I often am down at the beach getting grounded. But in my spare time, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I do a lot of self-work, a lot of learning and a lot of reading. Oh, very interesting. Well, we'll dive into all of that in a minute. <laughs> and because you're Italian, I have to ask this. Yeah. What is your favorite food? Oh, my gosh. Thank you for asking. <laughs> so I have to say my favorite food, which grounds me, would be my nonna's pasta. Oh, yum. Uh, there is no well, – the way my mother does a vegan sauce, so I mostly eat plant-based – um, and that came about because I found my body functioned better when I didn't consume meat mm-hmm. or dairy. And I want to be clear, I'm, you know, I respect everybody's way of eating. Sure. Yeah. For me, it was about plant-based eating, uh, particularly during treatment as I, my body was experiencing, you know, lots of different things and, um, my nonna's pasta and my nonna's pasta sauce, but my mother makes the best. She makes a vegan pasta sauce or a plant-based sauce, which tastes Yum. like meat sauce. So good. Is it lentil based? No, I can't oh. eat lentils because of the polyols. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a whole other ball game of stuff, but it's actually, she'll grate sweet potato and zucchini and she'll grate all these vegetables and she will allow it to sort of you know sit on the stove as you would meat Mm. and draw out that flavor and if you're buying great quality produce which you would understand the flavor is still the same depending on what soil it's been brought up in so pretty tasty oh that sounds amazing (laughs) and then as um as a professional you've worked as an educator and a choreographer so tell us a bit about what that work involved Right. When I got to um, Sydney, I was very blessed. I became, um, I got uh, a scholarship at the Australian College of Entertainment and I got a dance drama scholarship. So I was 23 to get this double scholarship. Thinking, Fantastic. This is rock star material. One of my teachers said to me, I really love how you teach and I really love your style of choreography. And I went, oh, okay. Just because it was something that I just did. And so I started uh, teaching and choreographing at the age of about 24 and fell in love with the educational aspect and the nurturing aspect. And it really gave me a lot more than what the performance did. Mm -hmm. So performing, I believe, yes, is a service, but it's very, very, and I say this with respect to performers, a little bit centric, you know, a lot of, you know, I need, give me claps and stuff. Well, and you have to work so hard on on yourself, don't you? And focus on yourself. Right. Mm. Whereas when I'm teaching, it's more that service element and Mm. watching someone else achieve what they want to, that became very nourishing for me. So being a choreographer, the biggest jobs I've done in terms of choreography were at one stage in your career, you want to actually make some money when you're an artist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do need to eat. <laughs> you just go, okay, I've done this whole dancing back and forth, jumping around thing. Love it. Made some great money from it. Let's buy a house. Let's see what that looks like in Sydney. Oh, my gosh. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I took on a job at a private girls' school in the Upper North Shore. And it was somewhat a little bit like, oh, and I thought, just do this for 10 years. It was one of the most beautiful experiences because it was a private girls school that honored academia and the creatives were often forgotten. Mm. So I grew this dance school from um, 87 children to 847, I think in four years. What a huge achievement. Huge. Um, But the greatest love was these are the kids that, at the school perhaps would have been forgotten or not necessarily honored as you know gracefully Mm -hmm. and they just won everything they just kept firing it so i choreographed dance works which were theater based and back before dancing with the stars and so you think you can dance it was a thing that i did where i just went well this is a theme that i know will touch people's hearts so i created a dance work that was based on what's going on in society and it just kept winning everything. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> they swept it all up. And then you, I believe you did some coaching. Was that life coaching or what kind of coaching? So at 39, I started to notice that my body was getting tired. I had mm-hmm. done my yoga training and I was, I'd always been in some sort of, I knew that my brain was in a nimble, ready to learn, ready to learn. And I had done, I had started a master's in events and I ended up giving that away because they asked me to teach some of the course. And I went, well, why am I teaching in something that I do? Mm. No, I'm not going to do that. So 
I ended up coaching because I went, my body's changing. I'm 39. If I don't do a transition now, Mm. the research I had done on midlife crisis, if you don't find a way to honor your dreams as a child, you will enter a midlife crisis. And for men, that is, I believe, between 25 and 45. And for women, it's from 21. Oh, right? that's so young. Right, to 50. If you can find a way to honour your dreams, then you don't go into that space of mm-hmm. midlife. Um, sure, you'll have moves and changes. So I thought, okay, what am I really great at? What do I love? How do I make helping people something into a business that's sustainable without becoming a psychologist? Yep. So I consciously chose not to be a psychologist. Um, coaching brings me the opportunity to help people where they are right now and move them forward. And that forward motion for me, where are we? Where can we go? That doesn't mean I don't value therapy and psychology. It just means that... It's just a different outlook. Right. Mm. And so people come to me and I can go gauge where they are. They may need therapy and I will redirect them mm-hmm. to a therapist or a counsellor. But if they're hungry and they're there, then we shoot for the stars. So you just help them make the transition and find a way. Exactly. And I think coaching, because there's a lot of blur about coaching, like what is it, you know, who, who, you know, what is a professional coach to a life coach? Mm. So a lot of us who are professional coaches, there's only about 20% of coaches are professional coaches. And that means we've gone through the training we have. We're with the International Coach Federation. We've got, we are under rigorous scrutiny all the time. And then there are others who have done a bit of coaching, which like kudos to them, but they're not necessarily trained in areas. Yeah. So if you're doing a bit of life coaching, it could be spiritual coaching or intuitive coaching. Professional coaches have specialties, whether it be business or for me in this situation, it would be chronic illness is one yeah. side that oh, I do. Okay. That's really interesting. I didn't really appreciate the difference. Yeah. Like with everyone, we have niches, but coaching has all like, oh, you're a coach. There's no real separation. So for me, I do life transitions. So anybody that has obviously in their cancer treatment or divorce, bankruptcy, where there is a really significant change. And then I also work with young businesses who Uh, lost in terms of their creative idea about how to create wealth how to create income Mm. and also how to create business relationships which is sustainable yeah I mean it's very important to do because I think the creative idea can be all consuming and and people can have a passion but it actually has to be practical and work doesn't it we've got to make money somehow yeah exactly Uh, there's one on your website I read there's one quote I love you said that coaching and dancing are the same to show people who they are and how they feel. And I thought, "Mm, I can see how coaching could do that, but how does dance do that? (laughs) Ah, great question. (laughs) So basically in dance, once you tune in with your body, as you do with a therapist, a coach, or in meditation, you're able to do and raise the blood, get it working exactly as a meditation would or exactly as something else would. So in coaching, we we try and do is we open the neural pathways by drinking water, by asking questions, by honoring what we're feeling. In dance, we do the same thing. Get them to drink water, open the neural pathways, the blood's moving around the body through the aerobic work and the creativity allows the body to feel. And this is why dancers are very, very emotional people and very, very... They're very centered as well. Mm. They don't always seem it, but they are. So that's how I see the, the, the relationship between the two. Because I was reading that quote thinking, but what if, like me, you're not a very good dancer? Can you still, can you still get a benefit from it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, in my other work, I write the quote, everybody can dance just differently. Yeah. And how we hear music must be by our own choice. What happens after the age of seven, which is our creative years, is people are not necessarily encouraged to pursue creative creativity because it's not a good career. It doesn't make money. Yeah, it's such a shame. Everyone's got it wrong. Right. And so then I hear from people, but I can't dance. Well, no, you can't do choreographed moves. Yeah, that's true. That apparently look stunning to an audience. But I bet if I put on music 
And I asked you to just move your shoulders away from oh, your yes. ears. I can dance at a party. Yes. Give me a DJ. I can do that. But <laughs> so nowhere in the definition of dance does it say you need to wear a cat suit and fishnets <laughs> and be choreographed. <laughs> So Mel, you um, you're obviously working hard. You're running a successful business. You're very busy, and then you get diagnosed with breast cancer. So leading up to the diagnosis, did you have a sense that there was something not right in your body? Thank you for asking. I sat in the bed. Um, sorry, I sat in the bath one day, and I looked at my boob, and I went, "Can I say boob?" Yes, of course <laughs> you can say boob. <laughs> and I looked at my boob and went. Oh, wow, that's a red spidery vein. I better look into that. And then a year and a half later, I was diagnosed. Oh, really? Did you look into it straight away or it took you that long to... In my brain, I didn't... It just... And this is where I I think I have to reflect on my awareness and go, come on, Stefano, you're an aware person. What happened? But I just went, there's something not right there. And it just escaped me. Yeah, I can understand how that can happen. And I think what had happened is, and I'm really grateful for your listeners today to hear something different. What we're looking at for breast cancer is not necessarily a lump anymore. We're not looking. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So So did you have a lump or just the... I did have a lump, but I'll explain to you, and I'm very happy Mm. for you to research this to to confirm it all. But in the old days, we're told to look for a lump. Mm. These days, we're told to look for and feel for any changes in our breast. Yes. That could be by color. That could be a lump. That could be a mass. It could be anything. And of course, mine presented first as a spidery sort of um, a veiny type of thing. Right. But it, it went away and it came. It wasn't there permanently. And also, I think sometimes you think, oh, well, I'm getting older. And you can sort of put it down Thank to that. Thank you. Right. Mm. So what I decided at the time when I was diagnosed, you, you, your question was, did I notice it? Yes. I, I gained 20 kilos. I And this is the year and a half mm-hmm. before I was diagnosed. I had zero to no energy. Right. So you really weren't feeling great. I wasn't feeling great. And I had just started this coaching business and I had put it down to, I was coaching around Australia. So I was going from state to state coaching. And it was great. I was in demand. I thought I was being a rock star. And I went, you know what? You're tired because you're working hard. Yeah. You're 40. Totally understand. Mm. I had a heart um, condition which required surgery and same kind of thing. I just, I was exhausted all the time and I just thought, oh, well, I'm working hard. I'm busy. You just explain it away. Mm. Explain it away. That's a really good way of describing it. So instead of explaining it away this one day, I started in about 2012 to get on top of my health. And it started out actually with a gastroenterologist. So what you don't know, and I don't talk about this a lot because it's when we talk about cancer stories, what's really important is to not necessarily talk about the intensity of the the effects of cancer but how we arrived at our diagnosis Mm -hmm. to be able to educate others so i actually was diagnosed within a six month period um with hashimoto's disease pelvic Mm -hmm. floor dysinertia and cancer goodness it wasn't just cancer and what happens is we put everything into the cancer bucket it's cancer's fault but Hashimoto's disease... It's an autoimmune. Right. Mm. And the other one was pelvic floor dyssinergia, also an autoimmune disease. Is that right? Okay. And autoimmune diseases, apparently, and don't quote me on this, come in twos. And so there's two of them. So first I was diagnosed with a hash, um, the pelvic floor dyssinergia, then the Hashimoto's disease, and then the cancer. Right. So you, something, your immune system wasn't working properly, was Clearly. it? And also, um, you said you put on 20 kilograms, so that's a thyroid issue? Yeah. Mm. And to be fair, at the time, I was not a smoker, and nor am I a smoker now. I hadn't drunk alcohol for seven years, mm. and I had So it's not adding up, is it? And when people... And this is why I'm really grateful. I think that we can attribute a lot to our food, but there are many other factors. And we, when we start to hear that don't eat this and don't do this, and like we just have to just chill a little bit yeah. and talk to the professionals who we trust and be okay because I wasn't a drinker. I wasn't a smoker. It was an estrogen receptive cancer. Right. It was estrogen. Yeah. That's right? not what you're eating or no. not eating. No. 
Um, do you have a history of breast cancer in the family? Yeah. So my great grandmother had breast cancer, but that's it. Right. Um, <laughs> and so not your mum. No. no. Obviously, everybody Good. got tested, and um, no one, no one had had breast cancer. But once again, it's estrogen receptive. So we all have estrogen. Yes. It's when the estrogen um, and the only, I mean, I, I don't like to formulate opinions or speculate, but at the time I was step parenting two children. It was under a lot of pressure, mm-hmm. uh, building a business, but I didn't eat estrogen and I wasn't, no. you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a tricky one. I don't, yeah. I don't like to speculate. <laughs> well, I guess the thing is we don't, really know we don't so um and the moment that you were actually diagnosed how did you feel were you shocked or were you numb or it's interesting that you've said those two words how i felt in the moment was i wasn't expecting that no now that's because i've trained my brain to think differently so elizabeth kubler ross teaches us about the stages of grief Mm. My research about the stages of grief is that they were meant for people who were dying, not for people who were just being diagnosed with cancer, who were going to live. So when someone immediately hears cancer, they use this language because that's all we know. Hence, with Cancer Confidence and the work I'm doing, I'm changing the language. Yeah. So in the moment for me, it was, okay, I wasn't expecting that because I know to use any of that other language in my head was going to mean that I was going to fall into a whirlwind Mm -hmm. of craziness. Yes. And I couldn't afford for my brain, my body, my heart, my mind to go there because for the first 30 days of diagnosis, your brain is like a trapeze. Doctors don't know what's going on in 30 days. They've got to do the testing. We've got to stop. We've got to, we've got to stop the Googling, stop the looking for it. So I did. I just switched off all my social media. Wow. Kept my head in the game and just went, um, this is what I'm going to do. And that is to not focus on what I cannot control and focus only on what I can um, manage. Wow, that's amazing. What what presence of mind to, to do that at that stage? I think the coaching help, like yeah. knowing all that work about language and neurolinguistic programming, that's... So I got to acceptance of my diagnosis and I got to acceptance of possibly the idea of death by day three. Wow. Well, that's a very good um, segue into talking about cancer confidence. And you you mentioned the language around cancer. So it's very common to hear hostile and warlike metaphors like, you know, battle with cancer, fight cancer, survive cancer. And that's really what you wanted to change, wasn't it? Thank you. So, yeah. so tell us about how how you decided to change that. In, in other words, how Cancer Confidence came about and what um, you're trying to do. Thank you. Firstly, I want to say that people, however anybody approaches their cancer experience, I respect it. If you feel that the war metaphor and fighting and winning and battling and having superpowers and being empowered by by hate and and fighting i don't want to disrespect anyone's Mm. views your listeners views all i can say is that based on the research around the world we are trying to find peace and calm in everything else yes but somehow in cancer we are still fighting And I'm wondering when we speak to the children who are getting diagnosed, we are not telling them to fight. We are telling them, go and play, have some fun, Mm. enjoy yourself. But adults, we're saying, you can fight this, you can beat this. So when people started coming to me and saying, okay, Mel, you can fight it, you can beat it, you'll win, I know you can, you're so strong, you're one of those brave people I knew. I was starting to feel anxious and depressed and my heart just flung open and I all I could think of is does it mean that if I don't beat cancer if I don't fight hard enough and I die from cancer that I've lost and I didn't work hard enough it's a huge amount of pressure isn't it and Mm. I vowed on that day that no one that comes anywhere near me will ever feel like 
they didn't work hard enough or fight hard enough and that's why they didn't beat cancer so how did you then go about if that's how you felt and and people were talking to you in that kind of language what did you say to them well would you like the evolved answer or would you like the answers that I gave sometimes when I wasn't having an evolved moment you can choose Mel (laughs) in an unevolved moment one woman said to me um, I was and I and I can't, I'll paraphrase a little bit. This is a bit of a story I had. So I'm in the shops in a beautiful suburb in Sydney called Mona Vale, and I was bald at the time. And she looked at me and she went, "Oh my gosh, you've got the loveliest shaped head." And I said, "Oh, okay," <laughs> smiling. She went, "I couldn't do that. You know, I, when I had cancer, my hair was I had to wear a wig and I didn't." And she's flipping her hair around. I'm like, "Oh, okay." And then she said to me, well, that's why you, you can don't have to wear a wig is because you've got a beautiful shaped head, head. And I just went and I said to her, actually, I have really great confidence, but I give good head. Is it the same thing? <laughs> and she was offended and shocked and laughed. But you get really sort of frustrated with the way people push themselves onto you yeah. and their stories and, and it their becomes opinions. about them. <laughs> so not one of my finest moments and I'm not proud, but it was very funny. <laughs> um, it did teach me in that moment that I, I thought to myself, well, if someone like me who has got my head screwed on most of the time is reacting like that, what, how are other people reacting? Mm. And I can tell you based on the people I speak to, they just avoid going to see people. And that's so sad, isn't it? They just don't want to feel the public and to, reaction. And to have to face all that sort of negative energy and the pressure and the pretending that they're fighting and, you know. Thank that, you. Yeah. And I say thank you because it's a real reaffirmation of the work I'm doing. When I speak to people who are currently in treatment, some people are in the fighting mode. And that's their prerogative. Yeah. And but the other people are choosing stoicism, or they're just choosing to hide mm. because they don't want anybody else's stories. Yeah, that's right. I know it's so it's it's funny that people feel like it's a license to sort of dump their own issues on someone who's clearly suffering. And anyway, so tell me, what do you do with cancer confidence? How do you help people? What do you do? <laughs> okay. So the last five years, well, the first thing that I did was I just took care of myself. <laughs> I spent the first, um, so I was diagnosed in November, 2014. And I spent the first three years being in cancer, mm-hmm. hearing, listening, watching, appraising everything around me, working with medical professionals, working with um, anyone that would listen and hear what I had to say and try and understand have I got something with this war metaphor and with changing the way we experience cancer? And as I gauged, I worked out that pretty much everyone I had spoken to was on it. The people that were dying of cancer were my greatest support. Oh, really? Mm. Because they said to me, once you get to that place of acceptance of mortality and that you are going to die, they found the they found peace. Right. The people around them were in the angry phase, mm-hmm. right? And and that's you know everyone's going to go through emotions differently. So what I found is the first three years was about me learning about what I wanted to produce, and that is a different way to experience cancer. We do this by changing the cancer conversation, mm-hmm. hence away from the war metaphor. Yes. Then I started to get really excited because not only did people love what I was doing and I wasn't coaching at this time I was creating the product I was creating this intelligence this education because nothing there is nothing worse than when you listen to something or you see something and it's flimsy it doesn't have any research everything I've done is based on psycho-oncological research and what I can tell you and I'm very grateful to say one piece of research says the benefits of cancer are yet to be researched That is very interesting. And so this is what I'm working on right now is the benefit findings of cancer. And so what do you think some of those might be? Well, I can tell you. The recent research is about how cancer helps you rise to wisdom, transcendent wisdom specifically, through what's called a defining life event. Now, in a defining life event, we know we talk about it as adversity. We get to adversity, 
and then we can you know from adversity we grow it's a little different a defining life event there are three ways where people are approaching it one is is they go eh, whatever they don't really care mm-hmm. don't change or 64 mm. percent of people are saying well hang on and they start reflecting back on their life but this is for people anyone in a defining life event not just in cancer but we must have this defining life event to get to this point and the 10 percent of people who see it as a moment of grace so mm-hmm. then they are the people who are going okay bring on this life event and then and let's not only grow from it let's create something bigger and better from it so when i started the research on the benefit findings i went okay so I'm going to go to the cancer industry and say, this is why cancer is a, a lifted experience and there are upside effects to cancer and this is what they are. Wow. So that um, I haven't heard of anyone else doing that, Mel. So you really are at the forefront here, aren't you? I am looking deep and hard at yeah. organisations all over the world and I'm noticing that most cancer organisations who are not-for-profits are doing sort of a little bit of a dance to the side, you know, Mm. with mental health or they are, uh, it's a bit of an add on for them about confidence. But is anybody specifically saying here is cancer and let's do something with it? No. And so if you're engaged by um, a cancer organization, what do you offer to them? That's all top secret right now. Oh, okay. I can't tell you yet. Because you're about to launch. I'm about aren't to you? launch. Yes, we'll have to do an update. <laughs> I'm about to launch. It's, it's more that it's, when I say it's top secret, it's that the cancer organizations that I'm talking to, we're, we're, we're just in that early sure, stage. Sure, it's confidential. And I just want to make mm. sure that all my information, they want to make sure that everything is well researched because yeah. I'm not a psychologist. So for people to go, this chick's doing something really cool and really different. Uh, and I and I felt this the first time. I've got to tell you a little story. Um, 5AA in Sydney, actually, I think it was 5AA. Uh, they were amazing. They rang me and they told me all these. They, they talked to me and they said to one of the doctors who was on, well, what do we do if we don't use this war metaphor? And they rang me and said, well, mm. what do we say and what do we do? And I gave them and they said, you're a really cool chick. I then rang the doctor and he said to me straight out, well, you're not a psychologist, so we won't talk to you. Oh, what and a narrow went, view. Oh, that was a bit sad. And I went, oh, listen, buddy, that's okay. I sort of get it. But I understand, look, the medical model has to run like the medical model. We've got other people in the cancer industry who are doing some really dodgy stuff. And I have to now <laughs> repair all of that stuff and do all my research and make it creative and beautiful and fun and exciting so that people can see. So it's, that's why it's taking me so long yeah. to launch. So basically there's credibility at the core of this. Absolutely. And you're building the creativity on top of it. Absolutely. Yes. What would you advise or what would be some advice you would give to people who are diagnosed with cancer? And Beautiful. Yeah. I love this question. I get asked it a lot. The first thing is Google nothing. Yeah, I've just heard people get say that as well. off of Google. You, I would say that for any disease, yeah. Yeah, get off of Google. There is nothing about statistics that you need to know right now. If you want to increase your anxiety and increase depression, then Google. <laughs> okay? Because nothing you can find. Even if you go to the World Health Organization, who I 1 million percent back, There is nothing that you can find in the first two days of diagnosis online that's going to help you. Mm. The first, that's the first thing. Get away from Google. Replace the Googling with therapy counseling. Or eventually download my program and start with me. (laughs) But the reason I've created the programs that I'm creating in Cancer Confidence or Cancer Freedom or Cancer Wisdom is because they are a 30-day program. They're the they're as cheap as chips because I couldn't sustainably charge people too much during cancer because i know how much it all costs yeah i bet Mm. right so my 29 dollars price tag is because i needed it to be affordable it's a bit like a gift in fact it would be a nice gift gift, wouldn't it it to give someone who's going through it yeah and it wasn't until the 119 people my business partners where someone said to me you know you've got 119 people supporting you on this and i went 
really? Isn't it just, they went, no, Mel. And I went, ah, oh. it's when they, I went, okay, I've got something here. And what they were most passionate about is that this was an affordable product that took no time to consume because in treatment and or in surgery or no matter where you are in your phases, you just got, you don't have the, the time. Or the energy. Yeah. So you click on one thing and it downloads and it's three minutes of me. Wow. And you just do that every single day, a little bit like a meditation. That sounds amazing. Mm. The other thing that's really nice about that model is that it, it's not then only for, you know, an exclusive group of people who can afford it. It's for everybody. Everybody. Yeah. So it's not about affordability. It's not about, like you said, exclusive exclusivity. It's about affordability. It's about people who are currently, if depending on where you are in your growth phase, mm -hmm. confidence freedom that feeling of freedom or wisdom so if you've done a little bit more work i do go into the metaphysical i do go into where you know the uh, universe higher power or god as you see them takes us so it can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be yeah that's great because i think overlying everything you probably need the practical advice the simple advice but then for people that are very interested they can dive a bit deeper. Exactly. Mm. For three minutes a day. <laughs> and that's, you know, when I started creating the model of three minutes a day, it was because I actually wrote a book. Oh, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> it's my next question. So it sits up. So I wrote a book and I was offered a, um, a deal. And I looked at the deal and I thought long and hard about it. And I went, oh, this doesn't feel right. Why doesn't this feel right? And it's because I didn't have the energy to read a book during treatment. Mm. And we know from research that people buy books and don't read them. Well, when I went to hospital to have my heart surgery, I took with me War and Peace because I thought, <laughs> what a brilliant opportunity. I'll just be lying in bed all day. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I didn't open it. <laughs> and that's it. Mm. Who has the energy to read a book? And, and I'm not suggesting that we don't have energy. What I'm suggesting is based on how we're consuming information these days. We know that three to five minutes is a great time frame for people to take information in. Yeah. So I took everything out of the book and created the products. And then I think if it's three minutes, it doesn't mean it's only three minutes of your day because you can spend the rest of the day reflecting on it or it comes back to you from time to time. And Well, you don't get away with much in my product, so I will actually coach you. So in my questioning, you will be required to do your own work. You don't have to write anything down, but I do have this very elegant way of asking questions and you making yourself feel like, okay, I want to answer that somehow. Do you know, I've just read and finished a book called, uh, it's in my bookshelf somewhere, The, the Alcohol Experiment, which was a 30-day program. Okay. And it was probably a written um, version of a bit similar to what you're doing. I think um, and every day you read a chapter and there were some days where you could write a little bit down or, or not if you didn't feel like it but I loved it because it was just enough that you weren't overwhelmed with information but every day there was that little reminder to make you in this case think about your relationship with alcohol and find out what it's really doing to you from a medical point of view so it's yeah it's, it's a different model and I didn't know I mean I think to myself how did I even come up with the idea and it was actually through a social media downloadable that I got the idea and I just went wow because social media when you run a business you think oh my gosh how am I going to fit that in as well yeah. so yeah. I went and looked at the way this woman was doing it and I went wow she's done a really good job and I thought I can achieve this and that's when I went okay this has to be short bursts of love um, what I wanted to do differently is I want in, when you log into mine, you'll see my face and I talk to you and all of my coaching is you get one episode, which is three minutes is just one take. So you get my blunders, you get my truth, because I feel that what's what we're losing online and in our online space is everything is edited. And it's so perfect. It's so perfect. Yeah. And I'm not a perfect human. I am human. Oh, no, nobody's <laughs> perfect. So You're pretty perfect to me. <laughs> that's what I loved about doing, yeah. doing that work.
Yeah. So you back to your book. I mm-hmm. think it is this the one. Oh shit, my hair. It's deconstructed now, but the reason it started with oh shit, my hair, and I love the name of it. And it so might, do I. It might end up being something else, quite possibly a one woman show. But the it's deconstructed to the product. The oh shit, my hair came because when the doctor said to me, and I won't explain to you how he said it to me because it really wasn't very good. He then said, and I went, oh shit, my hair. Not like, oh shit, I might die. And that's where I went, I'm a pretty confident human being. I know who I am. I like how I look. But somehow in that moment, I was more scared about losing my hair. That's not me. And that's when I had to check myself and go, Stefano, something is seriously wrong. Mm. But here's where it gets better. The research on the number of women who don't want chemotherapy or to use therapy because they lose their hair is pretty significant. It is their number one fear of um, losing, of having chemotherapy. And it does even get more tragic than that. Not only do they not want to do it, the the therapy, they will do anything to not do it. They will ask for anything else, please, anything else, as long as I don't lose my hair. They've now created hair follicle freezing machines that during chemotherapy you put on your head oh i have heard of that it's an interesting one and i have uh, strong opinions about it but only not because of them you know i appreciate we have to serve everybody if people don't feel like they're confident then follicle freeze away Mm. but it did make me stop and go we are grown ass women. Yeah. Well, the thing about it too is it's um, it's a problem that unfortunately, because of the way society views women, it's a bigger issue for women than men. Right. Women aren't perhaps don't feel as feminine or valued if they don't have hair. It's a perceived idea, mm. and I would say it is. It's a large majority, but once again, I am still asking the question: How are we saying that we don't have confidence if we don't have hair? Mm. That is the issue that I deal with in cancer confidence in the first program, the thirty days of cancer. Yeah, well, confidence. if that's one of the biggest issues yeah. for people um, facing cancer treatment, then you good to deal with it up front yeah mm. exactly and and like i said i'm not suggesting don't wear a wig i'm not suggesting don't address it I, I actually tattooed my eyebrows on before i started cancer treatment so i had eyebrows of course i wanted to look and feel great do you know what i mean but i did the internal work as well mm. and that's all i'm saying so how then did you feel when you lost your hair given that you'd done all that work do you really want to know yeah the most liberating time of my life. Really? I loved not having to wash my hair. Mm. I loved that every single day I looked in the mirror and felt a sense of pride Mm -hmm. that I was bald and I did most of it bald. Um, I felt, I I love that I didn't have to blow dry my hair and color my hair. And I realized how much time it took up. I didn't feel any less attractive. Oh, great. And it had nothing to do with having a nice shaped head. (laughs) I imagine, though, a lot of women would not have that feeling as you did. And so that's part of your coaching, isn't it? To help them arrive at that place. Wear a wig for as long as you need to. Mm. I I chose a henna crown, so I hennaed my head and I wore a lot of head jewellery. I've seen a picture on your website. It's gorgeous. Thank you. Mm. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying get the wig if you really want to. Come and do the work. You'll take the wig off and you'll be without the wig. So my friend who died from um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma seven years ago now. She she did have a wig, which she wore sometimes, but she didn't like wearing it because it was itchy. But she said to me she wore the wig mainly because of other people. Oh, my gosh. I can't even tell you yeah. how many times I've heard that. So yeah. in cancer, somehow we're worried about public reaction yeah, and how... And that- upsetting others or... Yeah. Like, do we even have an answer? I mean, this, just excuse me while I start to get cranky, Mm. because that sort of thing is what what I'm trying to alleviate. Yeah, of course. We're worried about what other people are thinking about. You know, we don't want to make them uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I get that cancer is triggery. I get it. We've all had an experience where someone we have loved has passed away, experienced cancer, not it, and it hasn't been a party. At some stage, what are we teaching our young women today? 
What are we, te- we're, te- we're saying to them, be confident, but look at us. We are yeah. adults and we're crumbling. Excuse me if I'm getting a bit cranked. No, no, bit sort of go on my go soapbox. But like we're sitting here blaming young women. Oh, that's because they're on their computers or it's because no, we are their models. They're looking at yeah. us being embarrassed and ashamed of our bald head. Uh-uh. Yeah. Not uh, okay. Yeah. You know? I'm, I'm, it, it's like it's a body image issue as well, isn't it? I mean, I'm always really careful around my girls to only say things that are really positive, like you know, strong and. I'm fit coming to and... live with you then. <laughs> <laughs> you might be disappointed. <laughs> There was a study done a few years back. Taryn Brumfit will tell you all about oh, it. Yes. She's quite amazing. She does an, a, great, a great thing called the body image movement. Yep. I follow her and I follow and I hope to work with Taryn Brumfit one day. And also, um, uh, oh, Jamil. Oh, oh, I can't. I can't it's coming, help it's you. Coming. It'll come to but you. But these are these chicks who are doing cool things. And, and also Kelly Jean Drinkwater, she's all about... Um, uh, embracing um, the fat and being okay with that. She's an activist, a fat activist. So we're not suggesting that fat is a great thing. Once again, we're saying that we've got to at some stage be okay with our roles, you know. Yeah. And these girls are all doing that. What I am noticing about um, the research, we know that 91% of women hate their bodies. Hate is a very strong word. And, it's and so sad. So sad. And I want to be clear, we are bringing up girls. We are depression and anxiety as forms, as symptoms are a thing. Oh, definitely. And somehow as grown ass women, we are sitting here and we don't want to lose our hair and we, and we are blaming the children or we're saying it's because of other things. No, 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 no. This is us. This is on us as adults, as adult women to stand up and do something differently. So Taryn is absolutely doing some great stuff with the body image movement. Totally have her back. I'm doing the same thing with the cancer confidence movement for people in cancer or chronic illness who may lose their hair and the change that their body image changes. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to be done from the sounds of it. (laughs) Plenty of good people doing the work. And apart from setting up cancer confidence and obviously being very passionate about what you're doing, how has experiencing cancer changed you, do you think? Mm, I love this question. Well, I should possibly expand. I arrived at the foot of my wisdom, which is what I call it, day three of diagnosis. And it's the point where you realize that everything else before you just didn't matter. Mm. That's the moment of grace of this defining life event. So I experienced this moment of grace. So how it has changed me is I am way more capable of compassion. Uh, I have a level of humility, which I never experienced as a performer. You sort of tend to make, you know, that performing mindset is a bit different to yeah. this. But I think most importantly, it's just realizing that I wasn't ever going to go back to killing myself to work a corporate job or high energy stuff I'm still very busy, but I'm busy being of service to people and listening to what other my teachers are telling me to do. Um, I think that's possibly my my greatest learning from that. But I will expand cancer, those three conditions. Actually, I was homeless for six months last year as a result of my partner leaving. And when you haven't worked for seven years. Oh, yeah. Right. It's tricky. Now, I want to be careful about how I talk about this. This is not going to be for everybody. For anybody who's listening that's experiencing cancer, this is a delicate situation, but it was a reality for me. Our homelessness in women of my age is growing. We are, I think, between 45 and 55, the growing, uh, the, the, the biggest number of homeless women around, not from cancer, chronic illness, people well, There's living. lots of reasons, aren't there? Right. That, that was yours. So how I've grown from that is that cancer brought me homelessness, which actually brought me home to Adelaide. And that has been a beautiful um, returning to true self, Mm -hmm. the person I was supposed to be, which is we're all born as pure beings. And I genuinely feel that I'm arriving or starting to embrace that pure being that I was born to be. Oh, that's gorgeous. That sounds, there's some, definitely some Buddhism influence in the way you're explaining that. 
and mm. I that it's my my teachers you know there yeah. are so many of them and most of my teachers follow the life of Buddha but I was born a Catholic so what I tend to do is I do believe in God and God as I see God mm. is actually a union of all the gods of all of the religions and that's how I see God and I don't believe in religion, so to speak. Not organized religion per sure. se. Mm. But I look at Allah and I look at Buddha and I look at God and I look at the trees and our mother and the earth and I go, okay, what if you all just hop over into that room over there, put on some music, dance together, <laughs> that's my God. Collaborate. Yeah, that's my God <laughs> over there. So that's how I sort of roll. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. I love that spiritual side of it all. Buddhism, is. there's a lot to it. I love it. There really mm. is. And whilst, while I don't, whilst Buddhism is strong in my learning, I'm very respectful of everybody's way to do God the way they want to do God. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. so easy to get. I mean, I, as a yoga teacher, you can imagine it's the foundation, yogic philosophy is the foundation of my, my learning. Um, and then of course, Buddhism after that in my meditation. And when I got back to Adelaide, I started to look at Catholicism differently, not from the Catholic way, but from the God, what I was taught about yeah. God. So the, it was really the higher nice. being and the, you know, the spiritual life that we all have. That's it. And need to nourish somehow. Absolutely. Mm. Outside of ourselves, whatever yeah, that is. Yeah, there's something bigger than, our, than ourselves. That's isn't right. There? And my final question that I like to ask all my guests, if you could recommend two things that all people could do to improve their well-being, what would they be? My favorite thing is find podcasts particularly podcasts or things that you can listen to and consume easily mm. for your learning why i say things about listening is because with information overload having books and having too much information can sometimes become overwhelming whereas listening it's our first step to learning to meditate and to practice mindfulness because mindfulness and practicing to be in the present as we mm. do by our by our gurus is what we're all really trying to achieve, that, that peace in our heart. Yeah. So I think podcasts, listening things, music, anything that starts to settle the parasympathetic nervous system, and that could be – so listening is the yeah, first thing. Yeah, listening. That would, I would say for well-being. And the second thing is, is if you need support outside of yourself, go and get it, whatever that yeah. looks like, whether that be a – nutritionist whether that be a naturopath a coach a psychologist for your mind or for your gut go out and find that person and make sure that that person knows your full story and if you make it about weight loss rather than health notice your language around that because i know plenty of people who carry a little bit more weight who are a little bit healthier yeah well that's <laughs> great advice and i think that applies particularly to women, I would say. Uh, women often neglect to look after themselves and their minds, or all of us, our minds have to be looked after. So Absolutely. thank you for that. I'm so grateful um, to have been here today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mel. And that was the gorgeous and gracious Melissa Stefano, founder of Cancer Confidence. So thank you for listening. You can subscribe to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast on YouTube hit the subscribe button and while you're there, click on the bell to be alerted when new episodes are available. You can also subscribe on your favourite podcast app, iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify or Google Podcasts. And you can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Direct links to all social media can be found on the subscribe page of my website at www.amandaswellbeingpodcast.com. If you would like to contact me, you can send me a message via the contacts page on my website. Please feel free to suggest topics you'd like to learn more about and people you'd like to hear interviewed, and I'll do my best to deliver that to you. Producing the podcast is a labour of love. We put in a lot of time, money and effort behind the scenes. So if you enjoy Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast and would like to make a contribution via Patreon, PayPal or by Amazon, to help ensure we continue to provide you with excellent content, please visit the Contribute page on my website. Finally, please take a minute to leave a rating on iTunes. It improves visibility and will help me source excellent guests. 
Thank you for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well.